Cyberbullying. To some, it's a far and confusing term, has little meaning to their lives. To others, it's a threatening phrase, a vicious form of harassment taking place online, in chat rooms, in social media. It is all too real and a serious form of intimidation in the 21st century. I didn't notice that anything was wrong until someone was texting me and saying, have you seen what's on your Facebook and why would you post that? This girl is a cyberbully victim, a teenager who wants to remain anonymous, explaining how during her junior year, more than a dozen male classmates from inside and outside her school, some she even considered friends, launched a group chat on Skype to talk about a sinister plan. They decided to hack my Facebook and use it as a platform to show all these different inappropriate photos of these girls. They also posted one nude photo, which I'm not really sure whose photo it was because it was headless, but they posted it on my profile and I guess we're essentially trying to pretend to be me. The photos of teen girls were posted on her hacked Facebook account on a school-issued laptop. The school initially thought it was coming from the victim, suspended her for two days. Administrators eventually found the real culprits, but the damage had already been done. I stopped going to school for about maybe two or three months. I wouldn't go regularly, and then I was kind of concerned that I may not get into college just because I'd been missing so much school, and I wasn't really too optimistic about the future at the time. Eventually, she made it to college and made it part of her own life mission to help other victims. In fact, there are entire groups with the same intention that are born from these kind of cases. The problem with cyberbullying, it's it's so different from bullying. Is you don't see the cases, and most people don't understand how s- severe a case can get until something very serious comes along. David Zhao is the head of a New York-based nonprofit group called End to Cyberbullying, with a goal of raising awareness, releasing information, and playing a role in reshaping the social media network on a global scale. ECTB began three years ago, right around the time a famous cyberbully case took place right here in the tri-state area. Tyler Clemente, a freshman at Rutgers, took his own life after finding out his roommate set up a live webcam in his dorm room, broadcasting his gay sexual encounters to classmates. For Tyler, Zhao says there was no one he could talk to about what was going on. So Zhao and his colleagues launched a website in response, realizing early on that not only was there a widespread problem, there were so many who needed help. Surprisingly, after the launch of our web platform for about two weeks, we had hundreds and hundreds of requests telling us and we didn't know what to do. And then this is when we got psychiatrists to assist. We got even various doctors to help out and school faculty members. And we started spreading like wildfire. For the anonymous girl who volunteered to speak to us, that was what she needed. Somebody to listen. Somebody, even faculty members who could have understood back in high school. I was a little bit hesitant about speaking with them afterwards. and I didn't really feel like they fully supported me just because of what had initially happened. But again, just because of the lack of, I guess, information or experience, I really didn't feel like there was enough support for me. The cyberbullying problem comes with questions that sometimes have few answers, but one that people are trying to tackle the most How do we assist victims coping with their attackers? The most fundamental challenge for our victims is actually that they have no one to speak to about their problem. We spoke with David Zhao in the first part of our series. He heads the group End to Cyberbullying here in New York and says there's a fine line between teasing and damaging attacks in cyberspace. The bottom line for the cyberbullying issue is really this mentality of how to use this technology really for a better cause and really to create an awareness around this issue rather than just talking about it. So we really want to get to the bottom of it and inform the parents, the educators, and our peers about this issue and change people's mindset about what cyberbullying is. It's not teasing with your friends, but it's actually can become very serious and have serious consequences in the very long term. The group's outreach is a step-by-step process, becoming a safe haven for those victims, especially teens and young people, allowing them to speak with their members without identifying themselves about their experience. Zhao highlights another key to ending this problem, having well-informed educators and parents. I would recommend for others, and especially parents, to really understand their kids and, and almost be their peer when speaking about their social networks or speaking about their friends, to really be their friend in, in a situation so they can be open to discuss any potentially quote-unquote embarrassing things with their parents. And there's another objective, one that might seem counterintuitive, addressing and helping the cyber bully himself or herself. The best thing to do is to tell the bullies, uh, quote-unquote bullies and victims, that to focus and channel their energy and their time to show them the future. And there's so many bright things out there, that you know, their career, their passion, the music, their passion in, um, in their sports, whatever it is. I think parents, educators should really focus on them and have them 
love something that they do. For Zhao, his group tries to keep on target with that approach, looking at the more comprehensive reasons behind the cyberbully issue. When they think, oh, I, I was teased when I was little, my, you know, we had horseplay, uh, all my friends are doing it, and we're okay, but it's the continuous torment for a victim on a day-to-day basis, and with all the support uh, emails that come in, you know, asking for support. It's people who don't have anyone around them that have no one to talk to. So what can we do personally to stop it? Is there anything as parents, community leaders, as adults that we can say tools and methods we can use to be there for young people when a cyber bully strikes? The private sector and the academic world have solutions. It's about protecting our kids. That's what it really boils down to. We have talked to cyberbully victims, to the people out there right now doing what they can to stop it. But what can you and I do as adults, as parents? What tools can we use to beat the bully? I really think that it is so important to put a safety precaution in place for our kids. Amita Jane is the co-founder of Teenology.com and chief spokesperson for TeenSafe, a mobile app that parents can use to monitor their child's smartphone activity, having access to a child's incoming and outgoing text messages, chat, and web search history. So that when they first get that iPad or that smartphone, that you are monitoring them and that you're letting them know, honey, this is a privilege. But with that privilege, mom and dad have to make sure that you are staying safe. Jane, who has two kids of her own, started the app after finding her son was having an abusive online conversation with a longtime childhood friend. That's kind of what got us um, interested in starting something that allowed parents to really be in the know because at that moment I realized how in the dark I was. Parents are allowed to legally monitor a child under the age of 18, but is it morally right to check up on your child this way? What is your intention when you're going into it? If you are going into it with the intent to spy on your child, then you are spying. But if you're going into the uh, into it with the intent to protect your child, then you're being an amazing parent. You're protecting your child from not only all the dangers that could be coming to them you know, with inappropriate information, age inappropriate, but also protecting them from themselves. There's the technology to counteract cyberbullying, and then there's the family structure at home. And it comes down to a study that finds something as simple as a family dinner can do a world of good. This may not sound like hard-nosed research, but in in social research, we're pretty encouraged to see a a strong, moderated effect like this. Frank Elgar, an associate professor of psychiatry at McGill University, Montreal, led a study that finds the more family dinners, which, as we know, involve a lot of talking as well as eating, the better kids can deal emotionally, which in turn can counteract the adverse impacts of cyberbullying. It served a, a buffering, a moderating a, effect here. So if, if kids had been bullied, but they, they'd they been having, uh, you know, family dinners was the norm for them. Uh, and with that comes with all the co- extra contact and communication. We finish as we began by looking at the term cyberbullying why it's such a mystery for many adults, and why it's such a pervasive and painful problem for so many youngsters. End to cyberbullying's David Zhao putting things in perspective, having the final word about how we can all fight this problem. At the end of the day, it's awareness, it's information that can really cut down cyberbullying um, and bullying itself. And it's not just saying, don't tweet something bad or go into specifics. More importantly, it's this over sense of uh, channeling this positive energy and doing something bright in the world. I'm Ken Duffy for 77 WABC.